you're most likely to be operating in. Which GSI? And which surface gap? This should be easy peasy. Let's see. I'm looking right. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. And the answer is correct. And it should be a high bar. Yay. Okay. And the reason for that is because, watch, someone explain it to those who chose something else other than C. Come on, make up, have Judy, come on. It needs to be something ambiguous. She doesn't know much about it yet. She doesn't know what her opinion is about eating opium food. It's the first time. Ariana has been dating her boyfriend a long time. Presumably she has some sense of how she feels about him. Megan knows about social psychology. Mupin knows about what it's like to be a college student and how she feels about it. Okay, it's been a while. Okay, it's true your opinions could change and you could be questioning later on, but no example is perfect. Okay, so most of you got it right. Terrific. Okay, let's move on. Fourth source of knowledge. And you guys already mentioned this in various forms. From other people, from feedback and reactions from other people, from socialization, how parents, teachers, your uncle, um, your siblings treat you. Okay, as a parent, you know we're always making comments like, "Oh, that's so sweet of you, Johnny," or "Oh, that's so unsweet of you, Sally," or you know, or you know, "What a great soccer player you are." Okay, all these comments, um, you know, accumulated over time, influence how kids come to see themselves, how we came to see ourselves, how your boss, you know, your longtime boss has treated you, the things, the ways they characterize you to yourself, to you directly, to other people. This has an impact. Going to church every weekend, going to mass on Christmas Eve, those sorts of activities, your parents treating you a certain that way, you have to go, can have an impact on how you see yourself. Socialization practices, socialization agents. Okay, somebody mentioned re reflected appraisal, and that is what the term looking glass self refers to. It was a term coined by actually a sociologist back in 1902, Charles Cooley, not relevant, not that important to you guys, but it, it has to do with this idea that we often see ourselves through other people's eyes, okay? Being an aspiring comedian, being an aspiring singer or performer, okay? How you feel about yourself, how you see yourself as this aspiring performance person is in part determined by how other people react to you. Are people cheering you on at the karaoke, karaoke bar? Are they telling you to sit down, okay? Or laughing, even worse, okay? Um, when people, you're trying to be a comedian, how are people laughing with you or at you? What's going on out there, okay? How other people act, react towards you is a source of information about you. Again, I'm not saying that how you think others see you is always accurate, and there's data on that. It's a really fascinating question, okay? But regardless of the accuracy of our thoughts about how other people see us, they matter, okay? They influence how we see ourselves, okay? So the social context, for heaven's sake, is the social psychology. So much in the social context. Here we're talking about actual people. Actual other people can have an impact on how we see ourselves. Okay. Related to this notion that the social context influences who we are is this notion of social comparisons. I alluded to this when I talked about the example of my sister and I swimming together and me comparing myself to my sister. Okay, that had an impact on how I saw myself, certainly my swimming abilities, okay? We make social comparisons all the time. What'd you get on the exam? Okay, well, you know, what school did she get into? What have you? We're making comparisons all the time. Now, the question is, who do we compare ourselves to? That is a very interesting question to many social psychologists. And we're gonna first focus on this notion that if you're out to get at the truth, really diagnostic information, which we're not always out to get, okay? Honestly, we're often out to feel good about ourselves, but sometimes we're out to get at the truth. Social comparison theory, a theory by Leon Bessinger, a name that you cannot leave social psychology without knowing, because he gave a social comparison theory, and in a lecture field, he will, he will talk about cognitive dissonance theory, which he also gave us, very, very prominent social psychologist. But in the theory, social comparison theory, he assumes that people want to get at the truth. And if that's the case, the idea is that you're going to compare yourself to similar others. Okay? And he argued that you're going to do this, particularly when there are no objective standards around. If there are objective standards around, you don't need to use other people as much to compare yourself. Now, the logic is this. If you want to get at the truth, it's not really informative to compare yourself to somebody who's way better than you are or has had many more years of training than you have. It doesn't make sense to compare your research aptitude to Maya, who's been doing research for five, six, seven years, and you are a first year research assistant. It doesn't make sense to compare yourself to a seventh grader doing their first research science project. Okay, you're above them. You're not gonna find out how good of a researcher you are, because you'll look awesome compared to the seventh grader, silly, but awesome, and you'll pale in comparison to Maya. So if you wanna get a sense of, gee, how good of a knack do I have for research, you're gonna compare yourself to the, the other RA in your lab who just started, or who just started last year, somebody who's similar to you. Okay, that's how you're gonna get informative social comparison information, diagnostic. Okay? Now, if you want to feel good about yourself, we're going to come back to this, go ahead and compare to the seventh grader. Okay, that's a different story. But here we're talking about wanting to get at the truth. Okay. Social group memberships. Okay? Your family of origin, your school affiliation, your political affiliation, your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion, the clubs you partake in here on campus, what have you. We all are part of various social groups. We feel a sense of belonging um, to these groups, and they are a source of self-knowledge for us. I am a Democrat. That says a lot about the things I care about the TV shows or channels I'll watch and won't watch, the kinds of newspapers I subscribe to, what have you, said a lot about who I am, to myself and to others. Okay, so social identities is the fancier term that is used in social psychology, refers to those aspects of your self-concept that are derived from these memberships you have to various social groups. Um, and it's important, um, I, I said the obvious, that you know, I'm a Democrat, so this means all these things about me, but what I'm really doing when I'm saying that is I'm stereotyping myself as a Democrat, I'm self-stereotyping, that is, I am perceiving attributes that are stereotypically associated with Democrats as being true of myself. When people think about themselves, it's really salient to them that they're a member of a particular group. Suddenly, in their I am task, they're going to be thinking about themselves very much in terms of stereotypic attributes of that group. So if this classroom were suddenly, we were visited by, you know, 100 Stanford students, okay, and they're red or whatever color that is, sweatshirts, they come in and they shred in, you know, and they stay around here. Suddenly, our Cal student identity is very much accessible on the top of our minds, and you can be sure that all of you would write, I am a Cal student on your Who Am I task, and all the stereotypic attributes that come with that, okay, you're self-stereotyping. Got it? Okay? You're the lone woman in a, in a room full of men, you know, you're suddenly thinking about yourself as a woman more than you might otherwise. Yeah. 
Um, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative stereotypes. Um, it's a complicated question um, in the sense that you would think that we wouldn't want to take on negative things, right? But there are data showing that you will take on the good and the bad, okay, when you self-stereotype. So if I think about myself as a woman in a room full of men, I might be more concerned about my independence, even though it's not a particularly favorable thing about women. But, but life is a lot more complicated than one process happening at a time. So Stanford students come in here, there is this sort of cold process of, ooh, cow student identity is daily in my mind, and there are all these good and some bad things associated with cow students, right? But there's other motivations at play, too. It's not this cold, calculated, stereotyping thing that's a cold process. There's some calculation like, we're better than Stanford, okay? And so we may be more inclined to think of ourselves in positive terms, okay? Because there's other kind of dynamics, other kind of motivations at play. But what you're wondering is, could self-stereotyping mean that you associate yourself with some negative traits? And the answer is yes, okay? Negative stereotypic traits may be more likely to characterize your self-concept when that group membership is salient, okay? Okay, the context that somebody uh, mentioned, which is terrific, because that, in a lot of ways, all the things we're talking about really boil down to context um, in, in a lot of ways. It could be long-standing context. Here we're talking a little bit more about momentary shifts in the context and how that determines who you are. And I'll tell you about two general tendencies that are, this is really obvious, um, but I'll say them anyway. One is that you tend to focus on those aspects of yourself that make you distinctive in a given context, like being the only woman in a room full of men. My gender makes me stand out. Okay, really cute study that I think we talked about in the textbook where you ask kids in a classroom to you know, describe who they are, and the four short kids in the classroom are particularly likely to mention their height um, because it makes them distinctive from everybody else in the class. It might be the smallest one in the class or something. Oh, I was always the shortest one in my class, or I was always the tallest one in my class. Um, so things that make you different from other people are often at the top of your mind. And that makes you different, of course, varies depending on the context. Okay? Um, we also focus on, this is utterly obvious, but let's say it anyway, we focus on what's relevant to the context. And that was the example that the person gave earlier, that while in the class, what's relevant is being a student. And that is the nature of your self-concept to some extent. Whereas when you're with your family at home, it's your role in that family. I'm the younger sister in the family. And that's how you're defining yourself. And suddenly you're more dependent and you're more whiny and you're more counting on everybody else to do everything. Okay? Because that's what's relevant to that context. Okay. Now what I'd love to talk about in the last whatever minutes I have here is this idea that you guys should really know intuitively, but I'll give a label to, is the idea of the working self-concept. Uh, self the working part here refers to working memory, okay? Short-term memory, what's accessible. Remember accessibility, priming, what's in short-term memory? It refers to the subset of that enormous range of self-knowledge that you have stored up in your memory that is in short-term memory, ready to go, that's on the platform, that's been primed in a given context. And I love this concept of the working self-concept because it is so true, okay? And it's so, it captures so many things that are true about everyday, our, our, our lived experiences, okay? And I'll let you write it down and I'll say why. I find it to be so compelling and so obvious and yet such a rich concept at the same time. It's, it's a wonderful concept because the reality of our cognitive architecture is that all of our self-knowledge cannot be accessible all at once. Okay, there's not enough room up there in short-term memory for it to be accessible at once. So just as sometimes extroverted is, is on my mind and I interpret somebody's extroverted, I am a professor right now. That is what is on my mind. That is what is in short-term memory. The me that is a mom, the me that is a middle child, God forbid, all those things are not on my mind, except because I just said them, so they are, okay? But they are not in short-term memory. What is in short-term memory is what the context is bringing to, to the fore, is making it accessible, is priming. Okay? Now, some of you may be thinking to yourself, wow, if you think about the self-concept always in terms of the working self-concept, who you are is shifting depending on the context, that's a little weird in the sense that we, in many cultures, especially Western ones though, we really have this sense of the self as this really stable, continuous, sort of core, sort of um, <coughs> locus of continuity in who we are. You know, we have a real sense of who we are, and we think who we are today, I would say it's the same person I'm going to be next week, and it's the same person I was last week. Maybe it's not the same person I was when I was 12, but there's some degree of continuity and stability in who I am, and we like that. Remember the prediction and control idea? We like to think there's a sense of stability and continuity in who we are. We want to believe that very much so, for many reasons, okay? Um, and yet, this working self-concept idea is like, oh, we're in this context, we're this way, we're in that context, now I'm somebody else, okay? How does this all go together? Well, um, some of you who have taken 150 before, or are taking it one now, you know about this idea that you can think about the self and think about the personality as having both continuity, stability, and malleability. And that even in malleability, even in these shifts, there can be continuity. What the heck am I talking about? Okay, here's the idea, okay? Adaptively, we are all shifting the working self-concept. Right now, you're a student, that is adaptive. Later at night, when you're with your friends, you are your friend, fun self, that's adaptive, okay, it's functional. Does that mean you're this weirdo and you don't know who you are, it's your student, your friend, what am I? You know, there's all this um, instability, there's all this shifting. Yes, they're shifting across different contexts, but there's stability in that shifting because every time she's in this room, she is a student. Every time she's with her best friend, she's giggling and fun. So even though the student, she's serious as anything, and with her friend, she's giggling, she has these two different selves, there's stability because every time she's in that context here, she's two different spirits. Every time she's with her best friend, she's giggling and fun. So, so there's stability or continuity in the self, even in, that, in those shifts. You with me? You're shifting in a stable way, in a predictable way. And that's where, some would argue, and that's sort of my favorite perspective, that's where you get that sense of continuity, stability, coreness in the self, despite the fact, of course we're changing who we are all the time. You know, that serves us well most of the time. Okay, you with me? Okay, all right, last slide for today has to do with a more macro level source of self-knowledge, and that's the broader cultural context, okay? We already, um, you know, crept a little close to this idea when we were talking about East-West differences in, in attribution and why there are those differences, that Westerners tend to think about themselves as these agentic, separate, independent, autonomous entities. And we describe ourselves often in, time, in terms of our traits, our unique traits, things that make us stand out from other people. This is what characterizes what Hazel Marcus and Shinobu Kiriyama call the independent control of the self, or independent view of the self. Whereas those from more collectivistic cultures, um, the usual examples given being China or Japan or Korea, these Asian cultures tend to define themselves in very much socially embedded ways in terms of their relationships with others. So rather than maybe listing a whole bunch of traits to describe themselves, they list a whole bunch of social roles or social identities. I am the middle child. I am a big sister. I am a Chen. Okay, all these kinds of self descriptors that really reflect a more interdependent, socially embedded control of the self. Now, consistent with the working self-concept idea, sometimes we think ourselves about ourselves in independent ways, 
Okay, there are certain environments like the American university that push you to be more independent. But when you get home and it's Christmas time and you're from a Mexican family and you're making your tamales, your interdependent self is more salient. You can have aspects of both. One of them may be more chronic for you than the other, but you know, we are capable of understanding both and living both. Okay? But in general, Westerners tend to be more inter independently construing the self, whereas East Asia is more interdependent. And this distinction is going to come up again and again. And it comes from the culture. Let me have my final minute here. Okay? What I'm not bringing out is why this happens, why this cultural difference. And what you need to understand is there are so many things in our culture, such as in Western culture, that foster this kind of construal of the self. Teachers want you to stand out. They give you stars. They give you special recognition. Parents want you to choose what is your favorite flavor of ice cream. Okay, there's a real push in all these subtle everyday practices, in our institutions, okay? in um, you know, the stories, in the magazines, ads that we have in our culture that push us to think of ourselves in independent in ways. Whereas in other cultures, you know, people aren't encouraged to stick out. Okay? Don't stand out. Don't make a big spectacle of yourself. All these subtle ways. You know, it's not about your favorite ice cream flavor. What do you think your friends are going to like that we should have? All these subtle practices, all these not so subtle institutions are pushing more for an independent self. That is the broader cultural argument, culture as a source of self-knowledge. Okay, we'll pick up on this on Wednesday.